continue this morning to look into our study in the book of Proverbs. And last Sunday, as Sister Carolyn had brought us through chapter 6, she stopped about halfway through the chapter. And she and I had talked about it a little bit Wednesday night. And I, and I said, you know, you're welcome to finish it if you feel like something the Lord shows you. She, but she said, no, you do what the Lord has for you to do. So I, I've been looking at it and, and praying about which way to go. And we're actually going to look beginning in verse 16 of chapter 6. And as the Lord leads, I really want to cover as much as I can in chapter 7 simply because it's, it's dealing once again with the, the importance of understanding that it's life or death that we choose. We either choose life or death. But what do you what do you mean? Well, the the direction that we choose to go with our life is either going to lead toward things that tend to life or that which tends to things that follow after death. And I don't want to go, you know, too around too much this morning because I do want to look at this. If I never realized how in the Word of God until after the Lord began to open up to me a revelation of all that Jesus did do for us, the finished work that he came to do, he purposed to do, he was the only one who could do it, and he done it. Praise God that he done it. But I never realized until after that and the revelation began to unfold in my life in my understanding, how, in, how many times in Scripture that it teaches against uh, false doctrine. Right. And the importance of being incorrect doctrine. Much of the church, they don't understand that. They don't understand the value and the, the, the life that is there to grab hold of. Now, I, I, I want to bring this to our attention to start, uh, to start with because chapter 6 and chapter 7, that's what it's dealing with. It's dealing with that which is to pull you away from things that tend to life. And we have to always be on guard. We have to, you know, as, as I feel like the Lord talked to us last Sunday, that we have to continue to stand. We have to stand. We have to have always be ready. And, and it's, it's not in a place that we have to carry the load either. We don't carry the load. Jesus is more than able. He's more than able to bear any burden that we would ever attempt to carry. So don't ever think that it's about us trying to make it happen. No, 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 no. We have to keep our belief centered and in the right object of his message, his truth, his gospel, that he alone is the answer. Because the problem that we face is sin. And God hates sin. Period. God hates sin. Man, not so much. Man, we... We find excuses. We find things that we can justify this and we can look to that and well this and that. No, we just, we have lost focus. And I, of course, I'm speaking of redeemed man. I'm, I'm speaking of those who are born again that know the Lord Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. They have received a new birth. There has been a new creation that has that has come on the scene. And now I want to do the things that are pleasing to God, but I don't know how to do it. That's the condition that the church is in if they don't understand and they don't have that revelation of putting their trust and faith, just like they did when they came to him to receive salvation, to continue to trust and believe in the same fashion that we did then 
in order that sanctification is carried out and worked out in our life. It don't all happen in one day. Much, many times we are delivered to a very, very, very great degree when we are born again. I believe that. But many times there's still things that, that we struggle with at times, and it takes a little time to, to gain those victories. To, so uh, please understand, that's not our battle. It's not our load to carry. The victory has already been won. And we are simply to take our part in his victory that he's already afforded, that he gave when he shed his blood, when he became the, the perfect and only Lamb of God. God hates sin. And we are sometimes, we, get, we lose sight of that because we truly believe and know that we serve a God who is love. He is love. And he truly is love. And we think, well, because God is truly a God of love, then he overlooks my sin. Because, you know, now I'm in his family. No, now that we're in his family, we stand to be corrected. We, we stand to be corrected whenever we need that correction. He's always there to provide. It. And he's all about correcting his children. That's, that's proof to us that he loves us. We belong to him. And he wants to correct his children. It's not my job to correct you or to correct another. But God's responsibility through his Holy Spirit, if he is allowed to just simply work on a daily basis, day by day, hour by hour, week by week, framework that we live in this thing we call time that we are subject to, give him the time. Let your, yourself be yielded unto God. Don't, don't resist that. Just simply keep being submitted. And I, I've said all this, I've got to read some scripture, but I'm trying to give you a little bit of understanding about what I felt like we need to get from these scriptures this morning. So first of all, I want to read through it very quickly. Verse 16, beginning in verse 16. These six things doth the Lord hate. Yes, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked imaginations, feet that be swift and running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. These are examples here today of sin, of the result that sin carries out within an individual. Okay, I want, I want us to, to look at this this morning to understand this. This is what, these are just some, some things that the Lord hates, okay? There's other things in the Bible that are mentioned. But I think you could come back and if we had the time and, and, and look at this and study this and carry this out, that it all comes back into what we're looking at here this morning. These seven things that are mentioned. Now, <clears throat> he, he truly is a God of love because he does correct his children. But I, I, I just, I want to mention this in Proverbs, it says in chapter 8, I'm not getting ahead of our study, but in 17 it says, when it's talking about wisdom and instruction, the scripture says that I love them who love me. Now let me, I just want to interject this thought. We learn the depths of God's love when we truly love and serve God. Does it change the fact that he loves us? He, he loves every single person that has ever been, that, that ever be. 
that's in heaven, that's on the earth, that's in hell. God loves us. That's, you're not going to change that fact. But to know his love, to experience the depth of his love, then he begins to reveal himself to us as we come to him. I, I cannot get away from this that I has been mentioning for the past, seems like two or three times I've been up here in James chapter 4. Draw nigh unto God. And he will draw nigh unto you. Amen. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners. Purify your hearts, ye double mind. You see, this is how God shows us through his word of how important it is. Don't take it for granted. Not to take it for granted. We, we, can't, we don't just coast through this life and thinking that, you know, I've got all there ever is and it's going to be, and God's got me right where he wants me to be, and if God wants me to do this, he'll do it. We're, we've deceived ourselves in that kind of thinking. We have to continue to have a heart to draw, to run after him, to draw nigh unto him. We have the promise of God that he is there. He said he promises, draw nigh to me, and I will draw nigh unto you. It, it comes with humbling ourselves. Humble yourself, he says, on, on out in through chapter 4 of James. Humble yourselves, and he shall lift you up. If we will humble ourselves before God. He will lift you up. I know I'm kind of back and forth on this. It also says, submit to God. That's a, that's a, when you say that, that sounds easy. That sounds, oh, I've got this. That is something we continually, because he said, as you pick up and you carry your cross daily, if you're going to follow him, we have to, Pick up our cross daily. Now, I understand that's not talking about you trying to do the work and you carrying the load. No, he's already done it. But to get the benefits that he's already provided, we have to understand that we are dead. And we, our lives have to be submitted continually. Continually. Daily even. Let's just break it down and say daily to continue to submit myself to God. Then he, what does he promise? Resist the devil. Submit yourselves to God. Resist the devil. So that is an automatic position that your heart then is placed in when I am submitted unto God. Then in, in turn, I am resisting the devil because I have chosen to submit myself unto him. So then he promises that he will flee from you. So that's why I know that we can, we can have encouragement. We can know beyond a shadow of a doubt that whatever it is life seems to throw our way, that if we will follow God's plan, that the enemy, our foe, the devil, will not rule and reign over us. We don't have to fear him. We don't have to fear his work. We can hate his work and be against his work. Of course we should do that. We should reprove the, the works of darkness. But we have to continue to remember and keep that do not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. So we, we do that and we exercise that as we continue to submit ourselves to God. Now, we're looking into some instruction real quick. In verse 20, my son, keep my father's commandment. For snake, forsake not the law of thy mother. Bind them continually upon thy heart. Tie them about thy neck. When thou goest, it shall lead thee. When thou sleepest, it shall keep thee. And when thou awakest, it shall talk with thee. In the Expositor's uh, Study Bible, it breaks it 
down in an understanding that this is a representation of the Trinity, of the work of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit at work in the life of the believer. And I don't have that in front of me, but I thought it brought out some good points if you have that this morning. For the commandment is a lamp. What, is, what good is a lamp, first of all, if it's not on? The commandment is a lamp. Then he says, and the law is light. And reproofs of instruction are the way of life. I want to, that's why, church, I believe you can take this simple verse right here and realize how important it is to be in a Bible-believing church. One that truly believes and preaches correct doctrine. This is how important that it is. It is a lamp, it is a light, and it is the and it shows, it says, what does it say? The reproofs of instruction are the way of life. The choices that we make, are they not going to be choices toward life or choices unto death? And there's not a person in this place that that could have chosen to do something else today. Uh, let's just get to where we're at. Right. You could have chosen to take a small vacation. Not that there's nothing wrong with that. Just don't do it every weekend. <laughs> okay? Good point. We could have chosen to do anything. But what I'm saying is because don't let the routine of things rob the, the joy of and the life that is afforded to us through Christ. It's good to have a routine. I love a routine. I mean, I find out, now every once in a while, I, I might turn the alarm off on the weekend. But you know, if I stay in a routine, I'll wake up right before the alarm goes off. And I'm up. No, I don't have to be on the job at a certain time, on Saturdays and Sundays. But there's other things I can do, like spending that little bit of extra time yep. praying, yep. reading, right. meditating, instead of trying to get prettier with beauty sleep, which ain't seeming to work. So I give up on that a long time ago. But that's part of our training. Let me, let me rephrase that. That's part of my training. Just, just keep your routine going. It'll make you feel better. It'll make you sleep better. And you'll understand more concerning what God is doing and, and working within each and every one of us in our life because it's, it's the way of life that we have to tend to. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back to this verse, but I'm going to cover a little bit more of this before we go in different directions. So remember that in verse number 23. This is what... This is what God has designed for us to do. He says, to keep you, to keep thee from the evil woman, from the flattery of the tongue of a strange woman. This, of course, once again, reminds us and tells us and is an example of the evils of false doctrine. Okay? This is not limited to it's not limited to physical adultery. The far greater meaning of this is spiritual adultery, which is far more damning. Okay, I understand that. I'm not condoning, and, and nobody here know. everybody here knows that I'm not condoning that it's okay to have, you know, physical adultery. No. But it's, it's, of course, mentioning this, but it's not limited to that. That's not the main issue that we have here today. Right. And it just goes on to say, I, wanna, I do want to read verse, uh, verse number 26. It says, For by means of a horse woman, a man is brought to a piece of bread, 
and the adulteress will hunt for the precious life. Always remember this when you're reading through this. This is not limited to just male and female or female to male. So we're talking about something far greater, okay? It's not, it's not saying that all the, that the women are bad and the men aren't. So it's not saying that. But it's the example the Holy Spirit is using to remind us of things that we see that have, that have taken place and, and, and have taken place for, for years, you know, just thousands of years with mankind. But he goes on to say the results. Can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Can one go upon hot coals and his feet not be burned? So is he that goes into his neighbor's wife. Whosoever touches her shall not be innocent. If you, if you go to the fire, you will be burned. You will be burned. Men do not despise the thief when he, if he steals to satisfy his soul when he's hungry. But if he be found, he shall restore sevenfold. And he shall give all the substance of his house. Do you have anything that you feel like at times that the enemy has stolen? Well, guess what? I believe you can expect him to pay back seven times. Maybe all, even all that he was, would lay claim that he has be given back to you. So understand this, this verse being interjected here in, in the middle of this adultery thing. Understand this, that when we when we look into a different source, when we look to a different way, when we look to a different one to, to provide for us, it's the, same, it's the same result as one that would steal, to steal, to steal something. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but just remember, this is not just something just thrown in here out of, out of you know, didn't have anything else to say, but there's a connection here. He says, But whoso committeth the notion of the woman lacks understanding, he that doeth it destroyeth his own soul. A wound dishonor shall he get, his reproach shall not be wiped away. This is this this is a cost here. It's a cost. Spiritually speaking, is what we're talking about. There's a cost. Then it talks about how the jealousy is the rage of man, therefore he will not spare the day of vengeance. He will not regard any ransom, neither will he rest content, though thou givest many gifts. Man to man, one will try to come and make things right. You may never, you may never gain, if it's a friendship, you may never gain them back. But what about us before God? Whenever we have rejected what he has to offer us, when he has rejected the only thing that he will receive for a ransom for our sin. There is no other. There is no other. So understand that this is, this is, how, this is how important and this is how serious spiritual adultery can lead unto. Amen. We have these examples given to us continually over and over and over. It goes on into chapter 7. Once again, given, before he even gets into the result, he, he's given the instruction. The importance of the instruction. And all the way through verse 4. I want to read part of this very quickly. Keep my commandments, this is verse 2, and live in my law as the apple of thine eye. The expositor's notes bring that out once again of the importance of the, the member of our the eye that we have. How, you know, this is kind of a little bit ironic, but I'm going I'm to use it this morning. As soon as I walked out the door this morning, a bug flew in my eye. And don't you know it? Whenever the least little thing gets in your eye, you, you know it. And we have to guard that. You know, God has designed our eyes, of course, our eyelids and eyelashes and things to keep stuff out. But every once in a while, something will just get in there. But we have to be on guard of that. And we, if we're doing something that's dangerous to our eye, we, we wear eye protection. So 
understand the, the importance of God's Word. How we are to protect that and guard, guard that in our heart. He said, he even goes on to say, to bind them upon your fingers. Write them upon the table of thy heart. Amen. How often do we use our fingers? We don't, I mean, we can't even keep up with how much we use our fingers. That's how important God's Word should be in our everyday life. Amen. Every day. That's right. Just like we use our fingers. You know, if we, if we didn't have fingers, God knew we needed fingers, so he gave us fingers. He knew he needed, that we needed his word, and he sent his word, and he gave us his word. Yeah. Say unto wisdom, thou art my sister, call understanding thy kinswoman, that they may keep thee, here we go again, from the strange woman. Who, who, who are we to... To say as our sister and our kinswoman, wisdom and understanding. His word, the revelation of his word being worked in our life. Changing us. Bringing about deliverance for us. That they may keep thee from a strange woman, from the stranger which flattereth with her words. Be careful the things... If the Holy Spirit is dealing with you about something you're listening to and telling you not to listen to it, we need to heed that. Amen. We need not to listen to it if he says don't listen to it. That's right. No matter who it her lips, mm -hmm. we don't want to offend the Holy Spirit. Amen. We don't want to grieve him. We want him to be close, working, and, and, and doing what he says, expert at doing. Amen. We want that. Then he goes on to say, and he, and he gives an example real quick. And I'm going to just kind of skip through this. It, it's, it's pretty well the same message throughout the rest of this chapter. I do ask you that maybe not at this time, but, but take time to read this whole chapter. Because it's basically dealing with the, the wiles, if you will, of the devil. And how he uses that to come in and cause people that are on the right path to stray and get on the wrong path. Right. So understand this is what this whole chapter is about. And how that this strange woman has, has put her eyes upon somebody and she's, she's spotted one said this is an easy prayer. Yeah, Can I say something? If we're if we believe that we don't have to to be part of a body of believers, we're just putting ourselves in greater danger. Because if you're kind of out there by yourself, you're easier prey. I'm just saying, no, this this being here is not your salvation. I understand that. I, I'm not saying that at all. But, but it pertains to the way of life. And we need to follow hard after the way of life. Not to stray from that path. Amen. I'm not preaching law to you. I'm preaching a heart change. Amen. When the heart is changed, it's, 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 not, a, it's not an issue no more. It's, it's what we do. Amen. That's right. they, people don't have to ask what you're going to do on Sundays. That's right. They don't have to ask. Yeah. It's, it's not up for discussion. I'm going to be where I want to be. It ain't on the lake. It ain't on the deer stand. It ain't at the racetrack. Nothing against those things at time to time, but just you can't live in that. We can't make that who we are, our God. Of course we know that. We have a pastor that preaches and teaches us that. It's okay to have fun. You don't live under the law, but when your heart is changed and you are, and you are absent, it's just... Some of that fun just ain't as fun as it used to be no more, is it? You can go have fun, but man, it's just something about being together in God's house. Right. And you can go all the way down, and the, the preparations that have been made, there's a lot of good things here, and Sister Carolyn may want to touch on some of it, that mimic the truth. Because the enemy always uses the truth 
are part of the truth to get you to believe a lie. So some of the things that are mentioned here when it, when it talks about having the peace offerings that, have, that are, are there today in verse 14, I have paid my vows. And as the expositors brings out, you can look at those notes and say, this, this never mentions the burnt offering. So understand that Calvary makes the difference. The cross makes the difference. The altar of God makes the difference. So we have to always keep that front and center in everything that we, that we put our faith into. The preparations of, as I, once again, the enticements are there for that, that man to go and to, to be with that strange woman. And he said, the scripture says, finally on in verse 21, with her much fair speech, she calls him to yield. With her much fair speech, with the flattering of her lips, she forced him. We have to be careful once again what we subject our ears to hear. And it goes the same way, of course, with our eyes, what we allow our eyes to see. There's gateways there to our soul that will change the way you think. That's the, the, the way the enemy uses. That's the way he has, he has changed and used people all across this country to change the way that they think right. through what they hear yeah. and what they see. Be careful, Christian. Amen. Be careful. I'm speaking to myself. Be careful. Mm -hmm. The things we hear, the things we see. Amen. Because it'll change us. Mm -hmm. It'll change you. Wow. It'll cause you to yield. To it go, that's right. It goes after her straightway as an ox going to the slaughter or a fool to the correction of the stops. Verse 23. Till the dark strike through his liver. As a bird that hasteth to the snare and knoweth not that it is for his life. And the cry goes out at the end of the chapter. Hearken unto me now, therefore, ye children. We are the children of God, church. Yeah, that's right. We are the children of God. Yes, amen. And attend to the words of my mouth. This is for God's children. Let not thy heart decline to her ways. Go not astray in her paths. Guard your heart. For she hath cast down many wounded, and yea, many strong men have been slain by her. That's one of the biggest ploys in this deceiving tactics of the devil. It says, well, I can handle it. Well, I'm strong enough. No, you're not. You're not strong enough when it comes against the evils the seducing spirits and doctrines of devils that are used to trap you and to cause you to get off the, the correct path. You and your own self, you ain't strong enough, but God is. Amen. If we'll stay in Him and pay attention to what He's telling us to do and to have obey His instructions, we, we can rest assured we don't have to fear. God's got me. Amen. He's got me. But you and your own self, me and my own self, we're not strong enough. chambers of death life or death go with me in closing I want to go back to, to uh, the sixth chapter and I told you it was going to come back to the verse number 23 I'm going to reread it and I'm going to take you over to John real quick and I have one more thing we may look at we may not okay verse 23 of chapter 6 for the commandment is a lamp and the law is light, and reproofs of instruction are the way of life. Go with me over into your New Testament. John chapter 6, 
And I really felt like this is something that the Holy Spirit gave me for this morning concerning this. John chapter 6, beginning in verse number 50. St. John chapter 6, verse 50. This is the words of our Lord saying this. He says, and I believe he is, of course, referring to himself. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. Do you believe that this morning? And the bread that I will give is my flesh. Let me, let me stop right here and say this. this. This is not saying that if you take in communion and you receive the bread and you receive the, the juice, that's not your salvation. That's not what he's saying. But that is a symbol. It is sim merely symbolic of us being in full agreement we have we have you know no holds bar we we are we're in all the way and we put our trust and faith in in his death so don't think that just because you eat the bread and drink the the juice that you're okay with god that's not what he's saying they are representations of his flesh and blood but he says in verse number, I'm going to reread this in 51. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If many man, any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. For the world to know and experience what life is, we must take and receive of his flesh. To receive of him. It, it brought great confusion to them. They didn't understand what he was talking about. And we'll skip that in verse 22. Verse 20, 53 says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no, zero, none. You have no life in you. Boy, I mean, that, that right there, that blew everything away that they had ever put their trust in. But Jesus was giving them an invitation right there. He was extending his invitation to receive of him right there that they would have life. Whosoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he, shall live by me. So it's by him, in him, because of him, giving his life's blood, giving him, himself as that perfect sacrifice, that we can have this life that he's talking about. But we've got to take and eat of him, to consume him, to know that he is my very bread Amen. that I need every day. This is that bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. And in, in, in verse number 63. It is the spirit that quickeneth. The Lord's been reminding us around here a whole lot about the quickening power of the spirit. The life-giving source, the waters of life that flow through the spirit of God. We've been, the Lord's been telling us about this a lot lately. He says, it is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profits nothing. Then he says, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. 
So the, the way of life, as we looked at into the Proverbs there in chapter 6, that way of life, there's only one true source of life, church. So much out there that the enemy tries to camouflage and disguise as what life is, or this is living, or I'm having my best life, all the kind of things that people like to say. It's Jesus. It's consuming him and he consuming me. Taking all that I am and just understanding that, hey, this ain't my load to carry anymore. This ain't my load to carry. It's not my load to carry. I, I was reminded of that earlier this week with Pastor Pastor David that told us, Brother David that told us about the, the story of the man that was picked up along the side of the road carrying his burden on his back. The Holy Spirit brought it to my mind this week. And the man told him, he says, lay, your, lay your, your sack in the back of the, of the wagon. He says, no, he was good enough to pick me up and carry me. But you know, the Lord is good about just, we'll just give him our, our burden. We may be in his wagon, but he wants your burden. Lay your burden down. Enjoy that life that he's afforded for us, the abundant life that the enemy is so seeking after to destroy. He's, it says that the adulterer seeketh after the precious life. It's precious to us, church, to understand and have that true meaning of life, to live it, to walk in it, I could go on and on, but I know I'm running out of time. But thank y'all so much for being here today, being a part of the class. I hope you received something today that will bless you. And uh, get ready for some good things the Lord has continued for us. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Thank y'all.